Today we're talking about a Ron, because peer pressure. Now my phone's been vibrating non-stop since December 27th when Iranian-backed militia missiles hit an Iraqi military base in Kirkuk, killing an American contractor. Now regular viewers may know, I really hate predicting things or expressing opinions on this show. I just like to talk about what happened. You know, the news. So finding a way to talk about this one was a little tricky considering how little we know. Iran is angry about us killing their general and says they're going to get revenge. Well, no one saw that one coming. How are they going to do it? We don't know. Where? Get back to me on that one. When? Again, not sure. Well, glad we cleared that story up. My goal today is to tell the story of the last week in Iran, Iraq, and American relations because I think it really gives a lot of context to the gravity of this situation and why it happened. One part of this story that is way underreported is that, of all the back and forth attacks that have been blowing up in the news, pun intended, the one through line is, it's all happening in Iraq. Man, I thought we were going to have to wait at least 10 years to get a reboot of that war. Now before I get into the last 7 days, I need to do a little more backtracking. Because two recent events have really changed the game as far as American, Iranian, and Iraqi relations. First, leaked by an Iraqi whistleblower that outlined the extent of Iran's influence in Iraq. The documents are dated between 2014 and 2015 and provide insight into Tehran's alleged interference in Iraqi politics. Those leaked documents really showed that Iran had gone all in on controlling Iraqi politicians. And it seemed to be working. This is partially because one name kept coming up as an Iranian agent with special relationships to Iraqi politicians. And you might recognize his name based on all of the wall-to-wall -wall reporting over the last few days. What we shouldn't be surprised about is that many of these Baghdad politicians spent time in exile as, uh, in Iran, had a long-standing right. relationship with one man in particular, Iran's Qasem Soleimani. He is the head of the Quds Force. That's the group of, in Iran, a special unit that has control over Iran's policy in Iraq, and he can be found everywhere having a significant amount of influence over Iraqi politicians. And now this story won't explicitly come up again. But keep it in the back of your head as to a possible influence over some Iraqi politicians as this story we're talking about today progresses. So that was the first breakthrough. Leaked Iranian cables really showed just how much influence Iran had over Iraqi politicians. The second piece to the puzzle was, well, turns out Iraqis weren't the biggest fans of being an Iranian client state. For the first time in a while, America was able to sit back and watch a massive protest that didn't hate us. It was refreshing. In Iraq's southern city of Karbala, one of the holiest cities in Shia Islam, hundreds of protesters are shown gathering outside the Iranian consulate, throwing stones into the compound. They scaled the concrete barriers before bringing down the Iranian flag and hoisting an Iraqi one in its place. A symbolic move and the first time protesters have directly targeted the country's neighboring Shia powerhouse, Iran. These were huge anti-Iranian pro-independence protests spanning the entire country. They really highlighted the divide between the people and their leaders, who unfortunately were quick to respond. Protesters are demanding political and economic changes. Many have also fueled anger toward Iran. It's the latest round of bloodshed and violence to erupt in the country. More than 250 people have been killed in clashes since last month. So with all that context, let's answer the question I set out to answer from the beginning. What the heck happened last week? Well, the story begins on December 27th with the bombing of a United States base in Kirkuk. This resulted in the death of a U.S. contractor and injured several American and Iraqi soldiers. As The Economist reports, the escalation began on December 27th when dozens of missiles allegedly fired by an Iranian-backed militia in Iraq called Kataib Hezbollah struck an Iraqi military base in Kirkuk. So America is seemingly pretty sympathetic right now, right? Well, don't worry, that's about to change. In one fell swoop, we responded to this attack in a way we thought would be pretty innocuous, but made pretty much everyone hate us overnight. 
The Pentagon says it carried out military strikes in Iraq and Syria, targeting a militia group. Khattab Hezbollah, backed by Iran, is blamed for an attack last week that killed a U.S. civilian contractor at an Iraqi military base. On December 30th, America launched airstrikes on the militant group that killed us. Sounds like a good plan, right? Well, there were two compounding problems. First, the Iraqi government. We called 30 minutes before the bombs dropped, and it turns out he was not a big fan of the plan. Iraqi Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi called the airstrikes a violation of Iraqi sovereignty and a dangerous escalation and threat to the security of Iraq and the region. In response, America said, wait, really? You didn't like this? Oh man, this is awkward. I thought this was going to be one of those formality calls, like asking a dad if you can have his daughter's hand in marriage. Sorry, but we're dropping those bombs. Now this compounded into a second larger problem. Let's go back to those anti-Iranian protests I mentioned at the top of the episode. The primary concern for Iraqi protesters was independence. Turns out, seeing a different foreign country launching a massive airstrike over the objection of their government against citizens of their country didn't really scream independence. Officials in Washington appeared taken by surprise when the killing of Iraqi citizens on Iraqi soil against the wishes of the Iraqi government ended up causing a savage backlash. The last reaction to this bombing came from the Iranian-backed militia themselves. They vowed revenge for the attack. No real surprise there, although boy am I getting eerily used to hearing that phrase. Now This brings us to the next day, December 31st, when we saw an attack on the American embassy in Baghdad. This is new video of the drama unfolding in Baghdad today. That's the U.S. Embassy surrounded by massive clouds of smoke. Hundreds of Iraqi protesters stormed the building this morning. They managed to make their way inside while U.S. troops were still present. The demonstration follows a series of American airstrikes in Iraq and Syria targeting an Iranian-backed militia group. This siege, organized by the Iranian-backed militia but comprised of a combination of angry Iraqi Iraqi citizens and militia members was occurring. It ended two days later on January 1st, hey, starting the new year on a high note. The full protester withdrawal came after leaders of the Iranian-backed militias who had organized the demonstration called on the crowd to leave, and most gradually drifted away on foot or drove off in trucks. So why disperse after two days? Well, the leaders later announced that their agreement to withdraw was conditioned on a commitment from Iraq's prime minister to move ahead with legislation to force American troops to withdraw from Iraq. Now, this wasn't exactly the hardest concession to get them to make, considering that the Iraqi government was super angry at the United States after we went against their direct wishes and bombed Iranian militias in Iraq. Between the bombing and the embassy attack, the Iraqi government said it was reconsidering its relationship with the United States-led coalition. The first time it had said it would do so since an agreement was struck to keep some US troops in the country. It called the attack a flagrant violation of its sovereignty. Now This brings us to the next day, January 2nd. When in the midst of all these back and forth attacks, the Iranian in charge of these militias had his plane land in Baghdad International Airport. With around a half dozen explosions, the Americans firing with drones clearly didn't want to miss their target. Iran's general, Qasem Soleimani. He'd reportedly just gotten into Iraq from Beirut and was leaving Baghdad Airport when he was killed in a convoy of vehicles along with a top Iraqi militia leader. On January 2nd, a day after the embassy attack, a United States drone took out that Iranian general. And I've got some good news and some bad news for you on this one. Good news, the Iraqi Prime Minister didn't object to this bombing like he did the previous one. Bad news, it's because we didn't bother letting him know this time. Yeah, they were really not happy about us Leroy Jenkinsing our way into a major and high profile assassination in their country. Now This lack of notification will come back in a while when we move a few days forward in our calendar. Of course, before I move on, I need to touch on the point more people in America are fixated on. 
this was a high profile escalation of the conflict. I mean, there's a big difference between killing Iraqi militia members and an Iranian general. Everyone was content keeping this little thing a simmering proxy war, but there were a few problems with this escalation. First, calling this move legally questionable would be the understatement of the year. Our forces are in Iraq today because 7 days after 9-11, Congress passed a barely two page bill giving the president new powers to attack any group, individual or government who is a part of planning, harboring or participating in 9-11. Unfortunately, I have seen children's books with more detail. The bill has been used over the past 18 years to pin 9-11 on more groups than even the most creative conspiracy theorists could come up with. The Philippines? 9-11. Djibouti, the Horn of Africa and Yemen? Hold on a sec and let me grab my red yarn conspiracy corkboard. Yup, 9-11. Now it's just the year 2003. The argument in these cases is that we're not at war with the country themselves, but rather Al Qaeda and other 9-11 adjacent terrorist groups operating in those countries. This is why, during the negotiation over whether the United States should continue to back Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen, there wasn't really a mention of the many American troops currently fighting a separate, congressionally approved shadow anti-terror war in that country. So what's the problem here? Well, in order to legally kill this Iranian general, we would have to get at our cork boards and tie him back to 9-11. And if you think I'm exaggerating in any way, I wish I was. The Trump administration defended the assassination on Friday. The vice president said in a tweet that Soleimani had assisted in the clandestine travel to Afghanistan of 10 of the 12 terrorists who carried out the September 11th terrorist attacks in the United States. Now, I don't want to go off on a huge tangent here and try to litigate whether Iran did 9-11 when my security clearance is Google, but I will say that the official 9-11 commission report found no evidence that Iran or Hezbollah was aware of the planning for what later became the 9-11 attack. Also, all of the coverage I read from both sides said Pence's 9-11 connection was a little bit suspect. Still though, this is probably going to go nowhere, considering we saw the exact same arguments a year ago and nobody really cared. President Trump announcing that for the first time the United States has taken direct military action against the Syrian regime. Now under Obama we had used the 9-11 justification to go to war with ISIS because sure they weren't around at the time, but eh, we'll round up a little bit. Citing 9-11 to bomb the government of Syria in response to a gas attack on civilians though, that was quite the leap. At the end of the day though, everybody just sort of agreed that, mm, who cares, maybe it was illegal, but what are you going to do? And it didn't really come to anything. So alright, we assassinated the Iranian general in Iraq while he was meeting with militia members because 9-11. Jumping ahead a bit, there have been several proxy attacks including a high profile rocket strike on our embassy in Baghdad. But the main updates to come out of this are, first, Iraq is really fed up with our crap. On January 5th we saw, The Iraqi parliament has voted to end the US military presence in the country. Some 5,000 US troops are serving in different regions of Iraq. Washington sent soldiers there more than four years ago to help defeat the so-called Islamic State. Now Baghdad accuses the US of violating its sovereignty by carrying out a drone strike on its soil. Yes, our 9-11 based anti-ISIS campaign in Iraq just came to an abrupt end. Now the main anti-ISIS force in the region will be the Iranian backed Shia militias that we were fighting. Good job Trump, you ended the forever war in Iraq. In the same way that the drunk guy who pooped his pants ended that obnoxious block party that had been going on for hours. The other big breakthrough was that Iran has officially abandoned the nuclear deal and is 100% going all in on building nuclear weapons now. This is especially alarming for me considering I currently live in New York, the most nukable city in America. Name one disaster movie where the Empire State Building remains intact. Yeah, neither can I. Now I'm sure a lot more updates are going to come pouring out. 
Especially since that whole Iraq kicking out the United States troops piece happened about 50 minutes before I declared the writing of this piece complete. It really helped with the narrative structure of the story though, so thank you Iraqi parliament for working Sundays to give my piece a satisfying conclusion. Overall, I just really hope that this video clarified some of the murkiness surrounding exactly what the heck just happened. Thank you, and boy oh boy, there is no way that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the... Well, I can't really call this story overlooked. I guess in this case clarifying the over-scrutinized and murky realities of the day, join this growing list of individuals by clicking on the link in the description. Remember to subscribe, and my new year's resolution is to get a thousand of you subscribers, and I'm so close to that number I can taste it. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring, and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.